All right, so we are going to talk about test-driven development today. We're going to show the Java version of the demonstration, but these principles are actually applicable for C++, C Sharp, Go, Python, you name it. This is actually something that can be done in almost um, any programming language. My name is Gonan Israeli. Hello, welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us. Uh, this uh, presentation is uh, being brought to you by Agile Sparks. Uh, I've been working with Agile Sparks for many, many years. And Agile Sparks uh, is not only an uh, agility um, um, workshop, they have uh, lots of hacks, they do uh, training, they do implementations, they do um, uh, agile uh, implementation in large organization courses. Excellent, excellent people, uh, terrific uh, uh, developers, terrific uh, lecturers. I, I can't say enough good things about Agile Sparks. I've always had the very best experience with them. Nice, super nice group of folks. Um, international certifications, there you have them in front of you. And uh, some of the best classes are available around anywhere. I usually get really, really good uh, feedback for my classes, if I may so humbly say so. And uh, some others, Moti, my good friend, who uh, I have talked to just now, uh, one of the best lecturers uh, and uh, developers all around, like really, really top notch. Global presence in here in Israel, abroad, you name it, okay? Who works uh, with Agile Sparks? Well, here's just a few names that you might know. Microsoft, you know, PayPal, Amdocs here in Israel, Verant, um, lots of uh, terrific customers. Let me talk a little bit about myself, one of my favorite uh, subjects. So my name is Gonen Israeli. I come here from Israel, so you can see the name resemblance. I am a software engineer. I'm an instructor. I'm a consultant. Uh, I started way back in the 1990s, even a little bit before the 90s. My first job was here at Florida in Boca Raton, uh, testing drivers for OS2, an operating system, ancient operating system that IBM tried to develop to run against Windows. I've got my degree in computer science from Florida Atlantic University. Then I did my master's in computer engineering, hoped that maybe I would work a little bit in the hardware field as well, but it never materialized. Software is just too interesting. And then uh, I lived in uh, the United States for about 10 years. When I came back to Israel, I did another degree, this time a master's in computer science from Tel Aviv University, a really, really, uh, truly terrific school. One of the top um, as ranked by research papers in the entire world. I worked at um, Freescale, which used to be Motorola Semiconductor, in the VLSI industry, which I really love because it's heavy with algorithms, routing, compaction, truly great stuff. I did a lot of consultation here at uh, Amdocs, Checkpoint, which is an Israeli company uh, known throughout the world for VPNs and antiviruses, did some outsourcing there, and a really, really big test-driven development C-sharp project at Nova with my good friend Eran Peel, my TDD mentor. I hope he's logged in. Eran, shout out to you if you're there. If not, I'm sure you'll see the recorded session. Really, really good experience uh, working in that environment. So basically, I share my time between instruction and uh, development and consulting. Instruction is my love. Uh, I love teaching. I teach people when they don't want to teach, uh, to be taught, and I teach people when they do want to be taught. Hopefully I concentrate on that one. And uh, I really like knowledge sharing. I also do some outsourcing. Sometimes people just give me, you know, create this uh, serializer for us or create this, uh, local area directory scanner for us. And sometimes I do actual consultation, which is embedding new methodologies, such as test-driven development, clean code refactoring into organizations. I live here in Israel. I live in Kfar Saba. You can see my location over here on the map. I'm almost a black belt in Taekwondo. Because of COVID, you know, lots of things have gone wrong in the world. One small, small thing is that 
my black belt test has been delayed. That's all right. I can, uh, I can live with it. You can see me over here taking my anger out on this poor piece of wood that never did any harm to anybody. And uh, speaking of COVID, Corona, hooray for Zoom. Thanks uh, to our webinar today, I decided to wear pants. So got me a good reason to get out of bed this morning. All right, so test-driven development is a two-day to three-day course. We've got one hour, so we're going to try to take just the tastiest bits out of this and, and see, like, what's it look like, get a feeling for it. Unit testing is also a one-day, two-day session. We're going to have just a little bit of time, so we're going to talk a, a little bit about what it means to do unit testing in, in TDD and stay just hands-on, just do like uh, examples in Java and Clips and, and try to get the feeling through the fingertips. All right, so what is unit testing? Well, unit testing is a test where you test a unit. So what's a unit? Well, hopefully we're in an object-oriented language like Java and a unit is just a class. Now, if your class is 20,000 lines long, you might divide it into smaller units, but hopefully you guys aren't writing code like that. Okay, so a unit tests, uh, a unit test tests only that one class in isolation, which has lots of benefits. If you find a bug, you know it's exactly in that one class. It's easier to fix. You don't have to wait until the entire program is written. You can test the units as you're building it. And, you know, imagine if a car manufacturer built the entire car with all the 50,000 pieces on it without testing each piece separately and then put it on the test track and try to start it and nothing happened. You know, we definitely don't want to go that way. TDD is a practice where the unit tests are written before the classes. So that's kind of weird. You have the test for the code before you have the code. It's like, how do I wrap my mind around that concept? In TDD, you start with all your tests failing. So we say, all right, it's red. You start with red tests because you've got no code. And then as you've got lots of tests that are all failing and you start implementing one class, oh, well, that one goes from X to V, from red to green. And then you build another function and then this test passes as well. And one third thing that's very important is you refactor because you write these codes, uh, pieces of code as fast as you can using the KISS principle, keep it simple. So they might not be the best quality at first. Then you go and you refactor them, you improve them and you run your tests again to make sure that everything still works. What are the principles of TDD? No code added without tests. Okay, that's very, very important. No code added without tests. So if you want a new feature, that means you need to add a new test for that feature first. What are the benefits of test-driven development? Where there are many, many uh, benefits. Of course, we get higher quality code, okay? Quality, less bugs, all right? But not all, that's not all. So in, a regular program in a regular uh, design methodology, development methodology, you write all your requirements on a bunch of pages. Okay, here's requirement one, requirement two, requirement three. And then you have to make sure somehow that you actually implemented all of these. This is called traceability. You need some sort of requirement traceability. And things can fall, you know, between the cracks and you might forget one. How do you make sure you don't forget? Well, in TDD, each requirement automatically becomes a test. You write your requirements as tests originally. And so as you build your program, if you don't make sure you implement the code for each one of these, your tests won't pass. And so you get excellent traceability. What else? Well, uh, design documents, what about user guide? All these tests are the best user guide that you can have. When you guys go into a new uh, development environment and they tell you, use this function F1, what do you do first? Do you go read a big, thick manual? How does F1 work? Or do you look for examples of how F1 is used? Probably the, the latter, all right? That's what I do. So the first thing I do when I go into a new project is take a look at the unit tests. So they're the best user guide that you can really hope for. What else? TDD gives you confidence in the state of your system. 
before you finished your product, you already know that 78 out of 79 tests are green. You have a good feeling about being quality code before you actually uh, took it out and published it. What else? Well, it gives you the freedom to improve your code, the freedom to improve your design. What? Well, what does that mean? How, um, how does it give you freedom? Well, when you guys write a piece of code, sometimes, not sometimes, always you're in a hurry. You've got your manager breathing down your neck and the manager's got the customers breathing down their neck. And so you hurry it up. And maybe you, you left something not in an ideal state and you say, oh, I'll go back later and I'll, I'll fix that up, I'll clean it up. Well, you know what? It usually does not happen because you're afraid. Ugh, you fear breaking something somewhere else. If you start messing around with these classes, who else is using them? I don't know, especially in an object-oriented environment. Well, TDD cancels that fear. It negates that fear. Okay? It gives you the ability to say, you know what, I'll go ahead and make that change and then I'll run all my tests. Now I feel okay about my change. So it actually leads to better quality code. One of the reasons is because it, it's a fear blocker. It's a fear eraser. Uh, what else? Well, TDD leads to smaller modular code. It turns out, just like in our car example, it's a lot easier to check each small module on its own than to check the entire complex system together and you know figure out what's going on. And so TDD forces you to create smaller, more modular code. And that's a good thing because smaller classes, smaller functions, more modular, more reusable. So TDD actually pushes you in that direction. So we like to say that TDD is not a testing technique. Is TDD a testing technique? No, it's not. TDD is a software development technique, okay? It's test-driven development, test-driven design. So the number thing, the number one thing, the most important thing about this is that it gives you better design, better, cleaner code. Does it also lower the bugs? Yes. Does it also increase the quality as far as, uh, you know, bug statistics? Yes. But that's like the second most important thing. It's not the first most important thing. Finally, test-driven development is fun. I guarantee it. If you do it, you know, I had an excellent, excellent experience with it in a few places. It really gives you a good feeling like you're, you're finally writing the code that you need, that you know you're supposed to write. You have a good feeling about um, providing a quality product. And um, that's, that's what gives you a good environment to be in. Also, you're using uh, the latest uh, development techniques, but it's mostly about feeling good about your craftsmanship. So I guarantee test-driven development is an excellent uh, work environment. Now, do you have to do TDD all the time? First of all, in places that are not used to it, maybe you start with unit testing. In uh, other places, you know, the techniques for test-driven development, unit testing, even if you don't use them all the time, even if under times of pressure, you don't have time to write all the tests and maintain that, just doing it for brief periods of time actually teaches you how to write good code. So even if you do it on a small project, or even if you do it for one iteration or two iterations out of the project, and later on you don't keep going with it, you do great, you do get great advantages from it. Actual tangible benefits from just doing it for at least bursts of time. Okay, I've talked a lot. Let's see test-driven development in, uh, in action. So let's see, um, what does TDD stand for? So it's test-driven design or test-driven development. Another question, how is TDD different when pairing? How is the work divided? Okay, so uh, pair programming is a software development technique where two people work together on the computer. I always like to smile and say that uh, one of them is writing and one of them is reading, or uh, one of them is <laughs> writing code and the other one is, is thinking. Now, when you do pair programming, test-driven development, the pair programming actually both practices of some agile uh, development 
uh, methodologies such as uh, extreme programming, for example. So extreme programming uses pair programming and test-driven design together, and it works perfectly. It's great. So one person uh, writes the test, the other one makes sure that he's writing, he's, he's not being too easy on the code. Uh, sometimes you can uh, divide it up so you switch in between uh, test functions, but from personal experience, TDD and pair programming works amazingly together. Another comment I've got, we're using TDD in our projects. We have a problem that unit tests are tightly coupled to the main code. It costs a lot of effort. It uh, causes a lot of effort to update uh, the main code since lots of units, uh, unit tests need to be updated. That is the price you pay for uh, unit testing. It's true. Unit tests are coupled to the code. And there are a few things you can do about that. One solution is to write your higher level tests. So you can do TDD with higher level tests. So uh, sort of some, some level of integration. It may be if I'll draw this, you know, let's take a, let's uh, share this. this. is an excellent, excellent question. Uh, where's my presentation? Here it is. I, I guess I could have used the whiteboard as well. Just thought of that. All right, so if we've got, oh, you know what? Let me run here. Okay, so here's a hierarchy of classes calling classes. This class A calls, this is not inheritance, calls B, and B uses the modules B, D, and E. Okay, and D uses I. So uh, I, if I test that, that's definitely a unit test. Okay, no question about that. It's, uh, it doesn't use anything else. All right, um, now what about D? If I use, if I test D, D uses I and J. If I take out the real I and J and I create dummies for them, then D is a unit test as well. All right. Now, if I test B with all its modules, the real dependencies that it uses, that's definitely an integration test. But if I test D and D uses two smaller modules and I don't replace them, is it an integration test? Technically it is, but we can treat it as a unit test, a higher level unit test. So one of the solutions to the uh, test being tightly coupled to the code is to go up a little bit, all right? Uh, other, uh, other solutions is to make your test as flexible as possible by only checking through the public APIs. The more you restrict yourself to the public APIs, the less bogged down you will be with tight coupling to implementation, all right? And you find you, you're agile, you, you gotta be agile. You find what's working for you and what's not. I have to tell you, sometimes these units over here are so simple, it's not worth testing them. You know, they have like getters and setters, not worth, don't bother it. You're never going to have an error in them. Also, unit tests, very, very important for me to tell you guys. Unit tests, if you don't write the unit test before the code, if you write the unit test after you wrote the code and you already tested the code, you're writing a unit test for something that you already inspected with your eyes, the chance that you're gonna find a mistake is super, super slim. So uh, good things to do, try to write the tests along at the same time that you write the code. Let me see if I have some other Q and A's there. There are two or more schools of TDD, which do you prefer? Uh, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I don't know which schools are referred to. And how do you measure quality of clean code or TDD approach? Uh, any metrics other than uh, defect count? That's a tough one. You've got to use some sort of metrics. Defect count obviously is an easy metric to, um, to measure, but you can also gauge it by customer, uh, customer feedback. You know, you can do surveys and surveys um, for the developers and for the customers is an alternative to uh, customer feedback. Uh, also, you should see your, your integration times reduced. So if your integration time is reduced, if it takes less time to integrate things, if it takes less time to make changes in your code, that means 
TDD is working for you. All right, so how do I clear this? Um, I guess answer, 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 answer. I guess I've, I've done all those. Okay, so good questions and no open questions. Anything in the chat, guys? Okay, we talked all about that. Uh, it's one more question. How do you mess, measure test code coverage? There are tools that I will demonstrate. Okay, so I will demonstrate test code coverage. All right, so let's start by stopping this presentation and sharing how much time we got. Okay, 20 minutes gone by. Wow, time flies. All right, so I will, I will display my screen and um, hopefully you guys can see and, and uh, read the fonts. If there's any problems with the sound or the visual aspects, let me know in the chat, okay? Because I'm, I'm kind of running blind here as far as uh, getting your feedback. All right, so we're gonna demonstrate this in Java. I've got my Eclipse over here and let's start a new Java demo. Should be fun, we'll call it TDD demo for lack of an amazingly interesting name. Okay, and I'm not gonna work with modules. Okay, so here's a uh, TDD demo module. Can you maximize your window? So font is bigger. My window is already maximized, but I will try to increase the font at least if you guys tell me that the font for the code is too small. All right, so since we're doing TDD, we need to create a test before we write the code. So what are we testing? Well, first I gotta ask my business managers, what am I supposed to write? Okay, so my manager is gonna go, go in, you need to write a calculator and this calculator is gonna have an add function. Now I know it's a simple school example of a, hey, it's a simple school one hour class. So we gotta start with small, simple stuff, and then you guys can extrapolate from that. So he'll tell me, give me a calculator that has an add function, but not just a regular add. Five and three means add five plus three plus two plus one. That's the requirement. Okay, so I'm gonna create a test class for that. Here's my Java project. I'm not gonna create a Maven one. It's just gonna be a plain old Java project. Okay, and this is going to be a package, I'll call it uh, package one. And inside package one is gonna be uh, my source code. Now, usually what I would do in a Java project is I would create a Maven project, or at least I would separate the source and the tests. So I would create another source folder. It would be unit tests. Okay, and I would create a similar hierarchy here. I would have package one in the production code and package one in the test code and so on. That's what you do in a real project. In our project, what we're going to do is I'm gonna demonstrate everything in the same place so you can see all the code together. So definitely don't write code like this, but it will be good for our demonstration. So in my package one, I'm going to create a JUnit test case. And since they asked me to write a module called calculator, by convention, I will create a test called calculator test. Now this just creates a test class. JUnit is a unit testing tool that we can use here, but there's, um, if you're using C Sharp, Microsoft Visual Studio has its own. If you're using uh, Go, Go comes with its own unit testing platform. Uh, if you're using Java, you can switch and instead of using JUnit, use NUnit and so on. So Every platform in C++, plus, in C++ you've got Boost Test, you've got uh, Google Test, every language has its own tools to do this. You just need some sort of unit testing framework. All right. And now we've got, uh, let, me, let me block out the dog. We've got saxophone players outside. We've got dogs barking. It's a whole party for the new year. All right, so let's me, let me create calculator test. And Eclipse is going to ask me, do you want JUnit 5? I'll say, okay. And it's giving me some sort of uh, skeleton. Now, hopefully the font over here is now big enough for you guys to see it. Let's see your QA. So hopefully, let me know if, it, if it's still hard to see. 
there's a myth that we can only test methods which are public. So public or protected is actually true. We do not test private methods by reason because private is considered an implementation detail. We'd like the test to keep running even if somebody changes the implementation. We don't want our test to change. You just heard somebody complain about how the tests are tightly coupled to their implementation. Testing of private uh, functions will make that much, much worse. So yes, we want to concentrate on the public or the protected. Uh, will this be uh, uploaded to YouTube? I believe I will upload a webinar like this for YouTube. I think so. Uh, and when to go for TDD over other methodologies? Uh, that's, that's a very hard question uh, to ask, but you've got to try it, all right? You, should, you need to do a pilot and see how well that works for you. And I, I want you to remember that TDD is not something that you choose. Do I choose Scrum or TDD? They are orthogonal. You can use Scrum and use TDD for your development methodology. All right, so I've got a little skeleton and I'm gonna run my test here by going run as J unit test. Okay, and I can see that my test failed. Okay, so J unit is lovely from Eclipse or from IntelliJ IDEA. You can also run it. It gives you this red bar. Did you have at least one failing test? All right, so a few things that we need to know here. This is just a regular Java class. The tool JUnit finds this class using something that's called an annotation in Java. In other languages, it uses other, mechanism, other mechanisms. This annotation basically says, this function is a test. Hey, JUnit, please run this test for me. Okay, the test name, we can make it whatever we want, but we wanna give it a reasonable readable name because if you've got a hundred tests and one of them fails, you want the name right away to tell you what exactly went wrong. So we'll go test, calculator, and we'll call the function maybe power add, okay? Now, what does power add mean? My business folks asked me that if you do power add five comma four, that is actually the first number plus a geometric series uh, from one to the second number. So five plus one plus two plus three plus four, that's our school book uh, example, okay? so. How much does that come out to these days? That's five, that's 10. Okay, so we should get 15. Can I do zoom, unable to see the text font? I actually can do that. All right, so I, that is actually something that I can do quite easily. Java editor test font, edit, and we can go, we can even go 16. Hope that's not too much. All right, so. Here's my font five, and here's my test. So, and I can see here it says, um, it, it's got the old name, let me re dandy rerun button in here, test count power add fail. All right, so let's write the test, okay? So we go, we imagine as if we already written the module. This is the hardest part of test-driven development. You're trying to test code that doesn't exist. We don't have the calculator class yet, and we are pretending that it exists in order to, to, to uh, check it. So we'll go, all right, let's pretend it exists. Calculator, um, calc equals new calculator. I'll create an instance of it. And now let me imagine that it ha already has this power add function on it. So I'll go int result equals calc dot power add five comma four, of course, this can't work as well. And finally, I need to make sure that I got the, the right result. So we do that with the assertions, okay? So I've got this function here, assert equals. It's actually a static function on an assertions class, okay? And what you do in JUnit and a lot of other test frameworks is you put on the left side, the value that you're supposed to get. That's called your expected value. So once again, five plus one plus two plus, plus three plus four, my expected value is 15. All right, right? You guys, am I doing my basic uh, elementary level math correctly? I think I am. All right, so I have got 15 and your actual is what you got from running your function. 
So that would be result. So we wrote our test, but <laughs> it doesn't compile. So TDD is actually a set of instructions. There's like a TDD flowchart or a TDD methodology. Okay, let me outline it. TDD methodology steps, okay? In TDD, step one is write the test. And that we have done. I wrote the test. But step two needs to be get the test to compile. But, and there's a big but here. Here's a big but. I exercise, so I hope I don't have a big but. But here's this but. But don't implement. Okay? Do not implement yet. So we need to get this test to compile. I'm going to ask the IDE to create this class for me. But you know what? I want to keep everything on the same screen so you guys can see the test code and the production code together. So what I'm going to do, highly not recommended for production environments, is just write the class calculator right here. So let me delineate this. This is here our production code. Okay, and over here is our test code. And of course, in a normal environment, this would be separated into two separate um, source folders in Java, uh, whether you're using Maven or whatever. All right, so next, this function doesn't, doesn't compile, all right? So I will ask the ID to add this function, power add int a comma int b, but remember we're not supposed to implement this yet. So I'm going to keep this automatically generated implementation that the uh, IDE gave me. All right, so let me run my test again. Forgot to call this B. Let me run my test again, and you see that the test fails. Over here, I have a failure trace. I could see where this failure came from. I can see it came from this line that says assert equals. Now, assert just means check or make sure that make sure that 15 is your result and it's not okay assertion failed expected 15 but was zero that's what it says over here for those of you who are unable to to see all right so that means i i, I got the test to compile and i didn't implement and the third step is what i just did and i forgot to say watch the test fail do not skip this part. Why is it so important to watch the test fail? Because an empty test in 99% of these testing frameworks is a passing test. Check it out. An empty test. It says it's a calculator test. It says power add, test power add, but it's a liar. You liar. He says everything's okay with my code. No. Not everything's okay with my code. I don't have the right code. This is a line test. And line tests are bastards. They are worse than having no test at all, obviously. Okay, because it gives you a false sense of confidence. What else could go wrong? I could write all of my tests and then forget the assertion, forget the check. If I rerun my test, even that works. Okay, so this third step, watch the test fail, is important. It's important to know that you have a test that can be red when you don't have the implementation and green when you have the right implementation. Any other kind of test is useless. A test that's always green, useless. A test that's always red, useless. That's no good. We want a test that's green when you have the right implementation and red when you have the wrong one. All right, so step four. Step four is implement using KISS. Let's give a Big happy New Year kiss to everybody. That's what you do in New Year's anyway. So what does it mean? Keep it simple, stupid. Hey, who are you calling stupid? No, that's just the way they added another letter because K-I-S is not a word in English. All right. So keep it simple means uh, don't build a big heavy mechanism that you may use in the future and you may not. Don't add caching, interfaces, whatever. 
keep it the simplest thing that can work. You will change it, you will improve it later. All right, so let's implement. So I will say return A plus B. All right, so step five, watch the test, pass. Okay, so this is the part where we go red to green. All right, so I'm gonna run the test again. No, A plus B, what am I thinking? It's a power add. All right, so great. Here we see the first time that the unit test saved me. You see what I did? I forgot that I was doing power add. I thought I was doing simple add. The unit test saved me. All right, so we see it working in practice. Swear to you, this was not it by design. I really did forget that I was doing power add. All right, so let's try to do an int sum equals or result int result equals a remember it's five plus one plus two plus three plus four if you guys are still following along for int i equals zero i is less than b plus plus i and we will add by design i'm gonna put a bug in here by design add b and return result Okay, so here's my first attempt and the, the answer and I'm getting 15, it wasn't 15, it was uh, 21, 21, oh, that does not make any sense, all right, uh, maybe I need to do result plus equals I, all right, result plus equals I, 15, but was 11, no, that's not right. Oh, because I start at zero. So I'm doing five plus zero plus two plus three plus four. Woo, thank goodness I have a unit test. Result each time needs to have I plus one. And now I finally completed step five and I watched the test pass. Will you get the recorded session in your mail? I think so. I mean, I, I think that's the plan. All right. And step six, don't forget step six, super important. It's not just red, green, it's red, green refactor. So now that I've got something working, I can show the customer and the customer could be an in-house customer, customer could be my scrum uh, leader, it could be my manager. I could say, look, the first version is working. Now, you improve on it, okay? What's Agile all about? Agile is all about giving a working solution quickly, even if it's a partial solution. And TDD is one of the techniques we use in Agile environments. And that's how we're connected with all this uh, um, talk about uh, Agile methodologies and Agile Sparks uh, being a, a big Agile uh, um, workshop and so on. So refactor and rerun tests all right so let's do that my refactoring will be uh why am i running from zero and adding i plus one that might be confusing so let's run from i equals one until four not before four and then i can do just result plus equals i that maybe it's a more sensible solution rerun that and there you go all right so we've got our first uh our first test completed and that's it that's tdd that is the essence of tdd thank you very much i've been going in goodbye we've covered it uh it's that simple i'm just kidding we've still got about 20 minutes we're gonna keep going all right uh do you uh, write and implement one test at a time you know there's no good answer to that some people like it that way, some people write multiple tests and then start implementing. It's really up to you. Okay, so that's a very, very good and a question, but there is no, um, there is not one single answer. It's agile. Look, try, see what works well for you. All right. Let's see. Um, let's add another maybe another one, okay? So I've got my uh, test cal uh, power add. Maybe I should have uh, another one for a border condition. So let's change this with a name that's me that says two positives. Now, technically, Kent Beck 
the guy who popularized test-driven development uh, in the 90s uh, or early 2000s said, don't add tests just for the heck of it. Only add tests that make you write the code. I mean, it's TDD, test-driven development. You can't write the code until you write a test. So that's really the only use for tests to get you to write the code. And he says, don't write tests that don't make you add new code. But it is agile, and my interpretation is a little bit softer. I say, if another test boosts your confidence in the system, go ahead and do it. So I'm going to say add a border condition. A boundary condition is, for example, zero. Add with zero. All right, so five and zero. And five and zero is, you know, all the numbers uh, from one to that. So that's just going to be five and zero. That's going to be nothing. All right. So I want the result to be five. And let's see if my current implementation handles that correctly. And it does. Okay. So even though this test does not stand the traditional Kent Beck authorized uh, test um, methodology, I still will add and say, you know what? Boundary conditions are tricky. This boosts my confidence. Um, when do we implement the design patterns? Super hard question because design patterns basically violate the KISS principle. Adding a design pattern is making your code flexible even though it's a more complicated solution than the naive solution lots of times. So where do you do it? Either you don't do the uh, design pattern at first and then you do it during the refactor stage or you might say, you know what, I've, I'm so experienced that adding the design pattern is for me already within the realm of KISS. Uh, are there any efficiency measurement tools for TDD and unit testing in C-sharp? Oh, definitely. All built in straight into Visual Studio. Okay, so Visual Studio, if you've got the higher level versions of it, Enterprise and so on, they've got code coverage, they've got everything built in, definitely. All right. So I've got two tests, but you can see I've got code duplication here. I've got two tests that are doing lots of similar things. Let's break down each test. You'll see that each test here is actually composed of three parts. One, set up the components. Two, call the function under test. We call that the FUT. Unit under test is UUT. And three, verify the result. Okay, so a lot of people like acronyms, AAA, besides being the Automobile Association of America, is also arrange, act, where you actually call your function, and assert. And I've got this AAA repeated, so how can I, how can I make things uh, less complicated. We hate code duplication, by the way. Don't get me wrong. Code duplication is our enemy because if I've got the same line here in a hundred tests and then tomorrow I need to send a new uh, parameter to the calculator constructor, I'm going to need to make that change in 100 places and I return to that comment that was made earlier by one of the attendants. They said, we are suffering. Our tests are tightly coupled to our implementation and it drives us crazy. Every time we make a change in the implementation, we have to change the test. This is one of the techniques that you can use to reduce that friction, reduce the duplication, make your tests more generic. So how can I do this? How can I remove this duplication? Well, basically calculator test is just a, cl a class. This is a regular Java class. I could do new to this class. That's what JUnit, in fact, does. It creates an instance of this class, and then it calls the functions. So I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take advantage of that, and I'm going to move calculator. Let's take it for a ride. There's calculator, and it is now a member. You can see it has turned blue. Okay, this is now a member of the class. All right, and now I don't need this arrange here. My arrange comes up here and this is something you can often do. You often have a lot of tests that have the same arrange part. Okay, and 
let me put this uh, little instruction here. Uh, it's uh, 5 uh, plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. So we remember what the requirement was. All right, so now I don't need my new calculator in here, and I, I don't need it here. So my tests are reduced size, they're simpler. And by the way, anytime you do something like that, also rerun your tests. Even if you didn't change the code, you only change the test. You got to rerun your test to make sure that you haven't uh, done anything wrong. All right. Uh, how does this relate to architecture? Well, it gives you uh, architecture really should not change when you change individual pieces, but it does give you a better design, which is, you know, a sub part of the architecture because your modules are going to be smaller. You're going to be having more modules smaller modules, which means in your next project, you can pick and choose things that were written in your previous project because they don't have dependencies on a thousand other things. You can uh, get better reuse between projects. Uh, test doubles. Yes, we will talk about test doubles quite soon. We've got about 10 minutes. And what is the naming convention? Uh, TDD for method names. There's a few of them. One simple one is start with the word test and then some sort of description that describes what you're trying to do and what kind of arguments. There's other um, methodologies for one. For example, one says uh, name of your class, underscore name of the current state, underscore name of the action, underscore name of the result that you're expecting. So there's, there's quite a few different ones. Uh, all right, so test doubles was a perfect question. That's the next thing I want to do. So let's say there's a new requirement from the business, all right? And the requirement says, uh, don't return the value, but write it to the database. And this is going to take us a little bit to more realistic things towards like the things that you guys are doing. All right, so this class uses another class. It's going to look like um, I'm going to abandon Time out, I'm going to abandon test-driven development and I'm going to talk just about unit testing now because test doubles and mocks are a complicated enough issue to show the straightforward. Uh, and so we're going to go just unit testing now, not test-driven. Uh, and I'm going to start by making the changes in the source code first. I'm not supposed to do that for TDD, but it will simplify the explanation for you guys. So I have this class and it's called a DB writer. And DB writer has a public function that's called uh, write value, and it takes the value to write. And guys, indulge me, pretend that I actually have code here that writes, uh, let's pretend. We have code here that writes value to Oracle. Okay, now this is going to present some problems for me. Okay, so power add changes to void, and instead of returning result, I go db writer, db writer equals new db writer, and I go db writer dot write value result, and that's my kiss. That's the simplest, na most naive solution. But there's a few problems with this sol uh, solution. First of all, if somebody else comes tomorrow and wants to write not to Oracle, but to another database like DB Writer 2, DB Writer 3, I can't do it. Calculator is hard coded. It says DB Writer, not DB Writer 2, not DB Writer 3. And if I start writing ifs here, if user 1, then DB Writer 1, if user 2, then, then my code gets super complicated. And it also will need to change every time some new user comes up, I will have to change it. So this code will never rest. It will never be closed. Another problem is this code is not testable. I can't unit test this. So look, my code, my tests don't compile anymore. They go int result equals. This is now a void function. Two other problems. This writes to the actual database. My actual database has customer sensitive in, in, in implement, uh, information. I, I can't ruin it. Uh, another problem, this is on the developer machine. 
I don't have the license for an Oracle DB on my developer machine, so I can't really test the code. So all of these problems, or maybe, you know what, maybe DB Writer is being written by another group, and they haven't finished DB Writer yet. DB Writer, they're still working on it, and now I can't test my code until they're done, and instead of unit testing, it's going to end up being integration tests, where you have to wait until everything is done. Okay, so all of these problems are solved by something called mocks, mocking, fakes, test doubles. All those words mean uh, small dummy classes that we use instead of the actual class. So I can solve this if I want to be test driven or if I want to do unit testing, I can solve this by creating an interface. I'm going to call, hold on, let me just move this. This is all production code here. IDB writer. That's my interface. And it's going to have the same function. Okay? And the actual production DB writer will implement this IDB writer. Okay? And I'm going to make this small change here. Instead of hard coding, hard coded new here, which creates many problems, creates flexibility and testability problems. Instead of this, I'm going to create a field called IDB Writer DB Writer instead. Now, obviously, this should be private and I should have a constructor and getters and setters, but I don't want to clutter all that with things that you already know about encapsulation. So I'm going to imagine that all exists and I'm just going to keep this property public or default so I can change it from the outside. All right, so how does that help me? Now, in my test code, I will create a fake class, class calculator arm mock DB writer or DB writer mock. And you could call it test double or fake or dummy. There's little nuances and how some people see the differences between a mock and a, and a dummy and a stub. Some people say if it's programmable, then it's a mock. Uh, other people have other concepts. It's not really important right now. They are all things that we use in the test instead of the real class. All right. And since I implement this interface, I have to add, I have to implement this function called right value. But what will I do here? Well, I'm just going to remember the value so the test can later check if that's the value that was written. So I'm going to create a field called value that was written. Written by who? Written by my calculator. My calculator is the one that's going to call this function. And I'm just going to remember what value did the calculator pass me. Okay, so value that was written equals value. Now I'm able to test this. Okay, now I can test this code. So I'm going to say, let's create a, let's do it over here. DB, mock DB writer, mock DB writer. Okay, and do a new mock DB writer. All right, and what I could do is I can hook up this to this. Now, let's do it simply here. Let's just do a calc dot calc dot DB writer equals mock DB writer. Okay, and now I'm setting the calculator, instead of using the real DB writer, to use the fake one. Production code will say equals new DB writer if they want Oracle, or uh, DB writer 2 if they want SQL server or whatever. So the production code is very flexible, and my test it, it, it can actually work. All right, so I will say calc the DB writer. This points to the fake, and now I'll say, okay, calc dot, um, not calc, sorry, mock db writer. On the mock db writer, I have that at little 
value that I added just for checking, okay? Value that was written. I'm gonna make sure that that's actually 15. Let me just erase that. And let's stay with this simple design, all right? And so it works, but you know what? We're not test driven anymore. And when you're not test driven, you can't watch the test fail. That's the problem with um, doing it uh, code first. Take TDD, reverse it, you get design-driven testing. <laughs> you get the design, and that's DDT. So a little bit of DDT, that's fine. It kills bugs and, and, and so on. It kills pests. Too much DDT is poison. So I, I don't get this watch the test fail part. What can I do? I can simulate that with unit testing without TDD using something that's called mutation testing. All right, so you've got a working test already, but you want to make sure that your test actually catches bugs in the code. How do you do that? You put bugs in the code. You go to your code and you take out this line. Will my, my test catch it? Yes, expected 15, but was zero. All right, or you take this line back and you say times two, okay? Run it, test catches it, expects it 15, but was 30. So you can simulate some of the benefits of TDD with claim unit testing by doing mutation testing. If you put bugs in your code, guys, please remember to take them out. Not a problem. How are you gonna to remember to take them out? You've got a test suite. You just rerun your test suite and you will remember that you put that bug in. Okay, so you take that bug out and our test is green. Now, uh, finally, those are handwritten tests, but there are also mocking frameworks that you can use that will do this for you. So let's demonstrate real fast because we're running out of time. I will take out this DB Writer class and instead I will add to my project a mocking framework. I think the best one in Java, it's called Mojito. Sounds like Mojito, right? Like that great cocktail. Let's go to build path. Mm -mm. Add external archives. That's, that's not right, is it? Build path, configure build path, and add external jars. And let's add an old version of Mokito. This is going to create a warning for me, but it's, it's easy because it's one file. So I'm going to use this old version. All right. And so we've got it under our reference libraries. And now, in here where this is the code that we use with a handwritten mock, I can use a mocking framework that will generate it. Why do I want to bother this? Because handwritten means more maintenance. You have to maintain it. So in some situations, it's better to use a mocking framework. In other situations, it's better to use a, uh, a custom mock, a handwritten mock. Whenever your mock uh, is supposed to be something that has state, like a screen or a database, I would actually not use the mocking framework. I would actually write my own, but let me just demonstrate it here anyway. So instead we will say, and now we don't have the class mock DB writer anymore. So what will my variable that holds the mock, what can it be? Well, I still have the interface. Okay, so I'll go, my mock DB writer, is now the interface. I'll go to the mocking framework, Mokito, and I'll tell it, please mock this interface called idbwriter.class. And what that mocking framework is gonna do is it's gonna do something somewhat similar to this. It's gonna generate code that's a little bit like what I wrote. Class automatically generated. Class implements idbwriter, and it's gonna implement these functions using code generation. Once I have that, I can ask Mokito now to make sure that the calculator and specifically the power add function actually into the mock wrote the value 15. All right, so I'll go Mokito dot verify. Please make sure that on my mock DB writer, and it looks a little bit like English here, it's a DSL. Uh, somebody did call the function right value and they did call that right value with 15. Okay, so we'll rerun our test. Okay, and the test passes. Here's my little warning that Mokito is using something that is soon to be not allowed in later versions of Java, but I'm gonna ignore that right now. And I will 
I tell you guys that as a paranoid person, I'm like, how do I know that all this weirdness with this mocking framework is really working? Sure, I've got a green test, but that's because I've got, you know, maybe, maybe because it does nothing. Well, mutation test to the rescue, enter a wrong result, run it. Mokito will tell me now, arguments are different. You told me to make sure that it's right value 15, but your calculator actually called right value 16. And I'll say, all right, all good. All right, that's basically it. I mean, there's lots of nuances. How do you do GUI? How do you do databases? How do you do embedded stuff? How do you simulate devices? But mocking gives you tools on how to do all that. Let me take some questions now. Uh, what do you think about um, uh, the given when approach? So BDD, behavior driven, uh, driven design, is a little bit of a twist on test driven design. It says, you know, why think in terms of testing? Let's think in terms of instructions. What do we want this test to do? Like specification. And I think it's an excellent uh, development technique. Haven't worked a whole lot with uh, BDD, but it's definitely valid. Uh, how do you use Mokito? Mokito has excellent, excellent information on their front page with super great examples, how you use it. It shows you how to do stabbing and mocking and so on. So lots of good resources over there. Can all the functional and technical aspects of a product be put into TDD? Here's a, a, a good example, a, a good question. Functional requirements great with TDD, non-functional requirements, not so good with unit tests. So uh, performance specification, usability specification, security specification, throughput and load specifications, all the NFTs, non-functional uh, requirements, uh, very non-functional tests, very difficult. And unit testing in TDD is just not built for it. And you need to do other things. now. Unit tests do not replace integration tests. You have to do integration tests. You have to do acceptance tests. A unit test fits out the rest of the things. So if your unit test works, but you think that the field in the database is called student with a small s, but the real database has student with a big s, your unit test will pass and in production you will fail. So unit tests are not enough. Uh, so definitely add some other kinds of testing. Uh, some lessons that we have learned from the past, you know, try to do unit tests for the higher level modules. Just skip the lower level modules altogether. You're not going to get a whole, a whole lot of benefit for it. So look for return on your investment. Look for a good ROI. Uh, what are the best books discussing the TDD approach? So I really like Kent Beck's book on uh, extreme programming and on test-driven development. I highly recommend that one. And uh, I know there's uh, some other good ones that people have re recommended like TDD by example and so on, but uh, definitely start out by reading the, the book by uh, Kent Beck. Also an excellent one is by Uncle Bob, Robert Martin. Okay, so look for a book by Robert Martin as well. Uh, can I share the slides with you? Yes, I will put the slides here. Let's take a look. Okay, so let me check into my drive one second and get a link for you guys. Okay, TDD. Uh, no, hold on one second. Bear with me just one second. Um, mm -mm. Uh, you know what? Well, let me give you this link. Here's a link for a previous session that I recorded and I'm going to put that link out here and, and I just check in and uh, like after the lecture and I will put the, the slides in there as well. So uh, chat, here's my, where's my chat window? Let me stop presenting for one second. Uh, check out this. Google Drive folder. All right. And I will put in this Google Drive. Folder. Right now, there's like another version of this lecture. So you already have like uh, the lecture there. I made a bit of a boo boo there. I forgot to show my screen for about 20 minutes uh, in the middle. 
but uh, check that out. And also, I'm sure Edge will get you the recorded session uh, as well. And I will also upload my presentation. You know what? I can actually do that right now. It's going to be there. Uh, all right. One second, one, one, one. And right now, currently uploading. No, one second, my computer froze. Come on, you can do it. You can do it, computer. All right, so the upload has started and in about one minute, you should have the PowerPoints on that link as well. All right, let's see what else you guys are writing me. Um, a, 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 arrange, act, assert, that's right. Do I have, let's see what other question I, I missed in the chat. Um, do you have a recommendation for a C-sharp TDD platform? Microsoft Visual Studio itself, best platform. Uh, let's see, can I show test results and, and expected, I, in the power ad. I hope I did that. Kiss means keep it simple. Stupid means you give a quick working solution as fast as you can and you improve it later on. About the books, I already answered. Let's see if I've got some more Q&A. Can I share the slides? I am sharing the slides with the link. Where's the link? The link is in the chat. So look in the chat window and you should see the link. Uh, I see other people questions, but did not get the link. Um, all right, interesting. Here's my link, link again in the chat. Okay, and if not, you know, we will send you guys the mail. You don't see the link again. Hmm. Does anybody see the link? Is there anybody that does see? No, nobody. Um, all right, tell you what we'll do. Hold on, I've got an idea. Okay. Let me do tinyurl.com. That should do it. All right, so I've got a tiny URL for you. So listen to this. Do um, HTTP tinyurl.com and then slash small y 2523. You know what? Let me share it and take a, you guys can just take a picture of my screen. Okay, share screen. Share my Firefox. All right, and guys, take a picture. This URL right now over here. This URL, that's like a little shortened, uh, a shortened URL that will bring you to my shared folder. Okay, tinyurl.com, y2523dbw. Okay, make it a little bigger for you. Okay, take a photo of that, take a screen capture of that, and you will see uh, if you do open new window, and you should see that, but also just, you know, um, have some patience and, and I'm sure that uh, we will get you a, uh, an organized mail with the links uh, where appropriate. Let me see if there's any other questions. Okay, got that, got that, done with that, done with that, link, link, link. Uh, any courses that I would recommend helping uh, explore uh, TDD and UT more? Of course, Agile Sparks courses for test-driven development. Um, you know, get get back uh, through uh, LinkedIn or through the mail um, to the uh, to the people that sent you this uh, webinar, and we will be happy to provide uh, test-driven development classes. Uh, you know, webinars, you name it. What else? Uh, we are actually implementing 
the actual code and then writing the test classes and then we making sure coverage is expected. Is it violating TDD? Yes, that is a definite violation of TDD. Writing the code first and then writing the test cases, that is not the TDD, that is DDT. All right, so uh, I was just demonstrating it to understand it, to explain the concept of mocks. Uh, let me think, is there anything else that we want to talk about? We've shown everything. If you guys can think of some questions, I can show you that test-driven development. Let me, let me go back to my presentation here. I wanna show you that we have improved our design. Okay, we've improved our design. Our design before was just, it was just a calc. Okay, and it was hard coded internally to DB Rider, I can't work like this. Let's try this, all right? So I'll share MS Paint. All right, so my calc, okay, it was hard coded to my DB Rider, DB Rider. Um, it was hard coded to my DB Writer, and so nobody could use it with DB Writer two, which was uh, no uh, was MySQL or DB Writer three, which was uh, Mongo. The test is the one that forced us to make the change. The test forced us because it wasn't testable. The test forced us to create this interface, and from the IDB do the mock that inherits and implements that interface, and then DB Writer implements it and then DB Writer 2 also and so on. And so the code is now more configurable. A production user can choose between these guys. A test user can do this. So we have learned throughout our experience with object-oriented systems that what's not testable is not configurable and what is configurable is testable. And that is the reason for the great popularity of unit testing and test-driven design. It's not an accident and it's not just a testing technique. It changes the way you write code. It gives you better quality code. Even if you stop using TDD after a while, you have learned how to write code correctly. Um, is, it, uh, is the choice to prefer TDD or DDT or does it uh, depend on the situation? Uh, excellent question, listen, Test-driven development has got a learning curve, okay? It's a learning curve. You've got to have uh, somebody who's experienced with it to help you along, and it takes time to wrap your, your head around it. And basically, you might want to start with unit testing and then try to do some test-driven development. You can do test-driven development in bursts or in focused areas. The great thing about TDD is that it provides lots of unit tests. If you could do all the unit tests, you know, you might be okay with not doing any TDD. But the thing is that people go, okay, manager, I finished my module, and, but I haven't finished the test. Can I start doing the test now? And the manager will go, sorry, can't do. New requirement, people are breathing down my neck. They're going, come on, come on, do the testing later when we have time. When are you gonna have time? You are never going to have time. And that's the great thing about TDD. It forces you to write the unit tests. If you're very disciplined and you can write all the unit tests later, it might be okay. Another thing to remember is writing a low-level unit test after you've already thoroughly manually tested your code is not going to result in finding bugs. Guys, you know, have reasonable expectations. You've, you've already gone over every line with a debugger and you've checked all the possible paths, now when you write a unit test, you're not gonna find new bugs. So don't expect them to. And then you say, you know what? But at least I'll have regression tests. And that's true. All the unit tests you've written are rolled along. You keep them in the source control next to your product. You have your product, you have your product unit test, and you've got this great safety net, safety net of regression tests. And somebody at the beginning of the lecture said, now this net is on top of me, keeping me down. Every time I want to change implementation, 
I can't change the, I, I can't change it because I, got, I, I have to change the test as well. So again, remember, try to do the higher level uh, test, like your units, your unit test should be a little higher level than the lowest one. Because once you've written a module and it's a low level module, it hardly ever changes. So yeah, you've got regression tests, but are you actually gonna catch regression bugs with low level unit tests from experience? No. From my experience, the unit tests or the tests that catch the bugs are the higher level tests. So they're almost integration tests. Um, computer science student, uh, somebody wrote me a computer science student sharing the last semester, starting the last semester. I want to specialize in automated testing. What would be the best approach to proceed in this line? Uh, so for automated testing, you know, uh, JUnit is like the number one tool. Yeah, so do a JUnit uh, course. There's lots of online resources as well. You know, there's online demos and courses. There's uh, lots of uh, free demonstrations on uh, YouTube as well. Of course, the difference here is that you've got interactivity and you can ask the teacher a question and get an answer, but there's lots of good, uh, lots of good online resources for that. Uh, if you're going to use .NET, C Sharp, and Visual Studio, you don't need much more than that. And um, what else? Uh, in LinkedIn, okay, so you guys, sure, my name is Gomen Israeli, look for me in LinkedIn, uh, feel free to connect with me, I will be happy to answer uh, any questions as well. All right, excellent, so I think we're just about done here. Thank you all so much for being with us, okay? Thank you so much. I will take that link link that you sent me and I will connect with you. All right, guys, thank you. I hope you had fun. I hope it was exciting as I promised. I try to make it fun, quick. There's a lot more to it. Um, happy New Year. And thank you so much, guys. Have a great rest of the day and have a great upcoming year. Thumbs up, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun for me. Hope you